So hello, everyone. And I am so glad that my friend Sherry can be here because I have to tell you all, after all the excitement yesterday and the ordination and all the work that went into it, I was feeling pretty much like John Murray. I did not want to preach. Like I couldn't think of sitting down and writing it. And just like the wind that blew John Murray uh, onto the shores of Thomas Potter's church, my friend Sherry blew in last night and said, hey, I've got this idea. Why don't we do this together and have a dialogue? And I can't tell you how grateful I was for that. So welcome, Sherry. Let's talk about the story and how it relates for us. I'm so glad you could be with us here. I can't imagine another minister and another congregation I'd like to be shipwrecked upon the shores of today. <laughs> it's good to be with you all. Absolutely. And I, you know, I do really love this story, but I'm also really struck by Thomas Potter's version of this story because he built this chapel without a minister. With He had great hope and faith that if he just built this chapel that somebody would come and preach in it. And I have to say, like, sometimes I'm like, where does he find, where did he find that hope? Where did he have that faith with so much going on and what's happening in, you know, our world? And I have to tell you, I've been sending you and your congregation so much love and thoughts, and I've been following you with the protests against the absolutely unnecessary death of Daniel Prude. And I've been watching the amazing work that you all have been doing in Rochester. Know that our hearts have been with you during that. Oh, well, thank you. And as I look at you in your sanctuary and Thomas Potter's hope that if you build the building, not only will the minister come, but eventually the congregation will come too and be together. It's, I can understand that hope that resonates with me these days, but I've been thinking, I've been thinking a lot about you and Arizona as well. In many ways, the desert there is my spiritual home. Mm -hmm. And it's been a little while since I've been there. The last time I was there was for Faith Floods the Desert when I joined an interreligious contingent, but primarily UU ministers to help bear witness to the humanitarian aid that's happening there. And of course, it's something that I carry with me and I think about a lot, but it's very much at the forefront of my mind now with the discovery and revelation of even more children than our cruelest expectations might have imagined. And even when it falls from the headlines, we know that the construction of the border wall and the militarization of the southern border continue. And so I think about the time that I spent there and all of you and the good work that needs to be done. Um, and I think I, lately I've been thinking a lot about when I was there with all of those just unabashed do-gooders and was with these good-hearted, lovely people, many of them UU ministers, and this thing happened that happens to me all the time, but was unusual for one reason, which is, you know, and I want to be clear, I'm multiracial, very white passing, white and Asian, Chinese. But because I'm Asian, I am subjected to the cultural script of being a foreigner and an outsider pretty persistently. The line of questions around where are you from, where are you really from, is something I know really well. And so while I was there with this group of do-gooders, we sort of hooked into that and somebody starts questioning me. And like lots of other times, there were lots of other people around me, white folks who didn't know what to do, but I know would have wanted, could feel the awkwardness. What makes this moment stand out in my mind was one person who I didn't know flipped that script and interjected, disrupted, interrupted in a really clear way simply to say, oh, well, where are you from? And turn it around and just move that moment, which I think lots of other people would have wanted to do, but likely because she had been prepared to do it, mm -hmm. she knew what to do. And it's only ever happened two other times in my life of the like over a thousand times I've probably been asked this question. 
three times somebody has interrupted that. Hmm. And that way of making something abstract, very real, feels really related to what our early universalist forebears have to bring to us. That is really, thank you so much for that, that story, Sherry. And, you know, sadness that that's happening and that it's only been three times. I think that that is a, a good reminder for all of us. So let's think about, you know, and this congregation, you know, we're still exploring what Unitarian Universalism and we can unpack some of these basics of universalism to say, how does that tie into interrupting and being prepared? And, you know, I think the standard line that we often say, you know, Unitarianism and Universalism, Universalism means uh, universal salvation. No one is going to hell. That's the easy answer that we say that universalism, but we know, you and I know, it's so much more complex than that, right? Yeah, so right, universal salvation is a part of the universalist heresy, great idea, but it's by no means the most radical. And I have been saying this when I go to city council to talk about the experience of protesters and police violence, someone that you all know, Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, when talking about you, you, the vote, she's been saying it. Our early universalist forebears didn't just believe that there was no hell in the afterlife. They believed that hell was real, but we create it right here in the here and now on earth. Yeah. And, you know, to build even more on that, if hell is right here on earth, then our responsibility is to bring heaven to earth, to switch that around. And it was so much more challenging than saying no one's going to hell. Because if we acknowledge that hell is here on earth and how we love the hell out of the world is how we change that and bring heaven on earth. And that's, I mean, talk about a radical time and a radical message, not just then, but now too, just as just as much. And not easy to do, right? It's really not easy to do to live that on a day-to-day -day basis. Not easy at all. I mean, so we come in Rochester, we're at a historically Unitarian congregation. We're an old congregation and we emphasize a lot the Unitarian idea of character over creed. The idea that what you believe is important, but only insofar as it informs who you are. But the Universalists, they take that to an even greater extent to say who you are is really made up of how you are. You are what you repeatedly do, which is an Aristotle line, but it is hard. It is hard. And I think, you know, I think about that original, um, original story. And one of the parts that's not often told about the story is uh, the role of um, Thomas Potter's wife, who was at that conversation at dinner, right? That's like right. she had, yeah, tell us a little bit about that. I know that you know a, a little bit more about her too. Sure, yeah. Well, so, right, I mean, this story that we tell of, sometimes it's just John Murray's story, and I think what's powerful about it is that it's a team effort, right? It's not, John Murray is nothing on those rocks. I mean, he is something inherently worthy and dignified, of let's course. be clear. But, Thomas Potter's role in this story is obviously really critical, but his wife gets named and then we don't really talk about her, but is extremely critical to this story because she was so sick of Thomas holding conversations around universalism in the living room and not doing anything about it. That basically she said, Thomas, you gotta build something. If anything is going to happen, you have to invite that love in. You can't just like constantly be talking about it here with the us. And, you know, John Murray comes with a crew. There are lots of people involved in this story who go unnamed and yet their role is incredibly critical. I love that. And I love how that ties in to the idea of being prepared. 
So she was telling him to be prepared, to practice what you were saying, that that Unitarian idea of practice, practice, practice. And, you know, we're practicing all the time. So last week, Sherry, actually, our director of children's ministries, Katie Resendez, talked about universalist love and was talking about the experience that some people might have had when the head of the United States got COVID and what is our role in universal love when that happens and was talking about that it is not our job to love everyone, um, that we have a certain focus on it. But I think it also extends you know, beyond that too, that the spiritual question is not how we love this one person, it's how do we grieve for the million people who have died of this disease? How do we look at the entirety and bringing it back to that idea of hell on earth rather than about that one person, that really universalist view, right? Like that's, you know, and, and that's a challenge too. And how do we practice and be prepared to do that kind of loving? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's not that the head of the U.S. government isn't uh, a valid spiritual question. It's just it takes you a while to get there. If you've got over a million people to hold in your heart and pray for and grieve and bear witness to, it might be a while before you get to that point in line. And that really, as you said, I think that is the central spiritual question of universalism is bit by bit, how do you pour as much love into the world right now in front of you? Yeah. And so that leads us to our time, right? That's where we are right now. Yeah. So, right. I mean, you, you bring up politics. I, I don't know about all of you, but I know in Rochester, we're a little anxious. We've a started, little early. We've started little. early voting yesterday. We've got a couple of weeks until the election. And we're at this historical moment that feels and is incredibly critical, right? On the spectrum of possibilities, will we be called to nonviolently resist the crumbling of democratic institutions? Will we need to in some way bear witness or even protect in body those subjected to post-election violent flare-ups? Right, right. It really, I mean, we don't, we've been voting for a couple of weeks um, here. And so it feels like this long wait Right. And we know that it's going to be an even longer wait. We one of the things we know is that we probably won't know all the things right away. Um, but it does you know, remind me then let's tying this back to that that universalism story. So there's a there's a universalist proclamation that's in our hymnal that says, give them not hell, but hope and courage, not hell, but hope and courage. So how do we do that? How do we bring in our potterism? How do we prepare for what we are fairly certain will be a very challenging next few weeks? I'm so delighted to hear you say potterism. I think in <laughs> made that up. <laughs> no, no, I liked it. I liked it. I, I'm going to both try to embody potterism and potter's wifeism. Yes, yes. And, and maybe dive into our historical record and figure out if I can't figure out her name, because I bet she has. I know. I was like, but, oh, we're just calling her Thomas Potter's wife. She's. I know she's got a name. So let's, she's let's definitely sure got one. That. We will find out. But anyway, all of that's to say, how do we lean into this moment of preparation and pour out love bit by bit. And so thinking about that story that I shared earlier, you know, one of the important things about it is, of course, I know that script really well of being deemed other and foreigner, but the vast majority of the array of different manifestations of racism in this country do not fall upon me. Right. I carry an incredible amount of privilege. Yeah, and in this same way, in this moment, I can look at both where am I safe? Where am I able to move out of a place of love? Where am I able to take risks and where can I best apply that love? So, you know, we're doing lots of things here in Rochester to help us tap out of anxiety on that day, because it's really easy to doom scroll and refresh news. But 
I'm also taking a look at my block. Now, it's a mixed race neighborhood. And there are people in my neighborhood who, as we've been watching cars drive by over the last month or so of counter protesters who are going to harass the protesters who are fighting for justice in the wake of Daniel Prude's killing. I know that I'm prepared to, if someone were to, let's say, harass them or they don't feel safe in their home, I'm prepared to go sit on their porch with them. Mm -hmm. We can be COVID safe and they will know that they're not alone. Mm -hmm. I know that we have the relationship right now that makes that make sense. And I know that they're more likely to be targeted than I am. So that give them hope and courage, not hell. That's not just a job for ministers. It wasn't just a job for John Murray. The Potterism is an invitation to us all. It is. It is. And I knew that it would happen, but my lovely folks have found her name. Her name is Mary. Mary Potter. I love you all. You're so great. And so I really thank you for that idea and that really concrete idea of it, Sherry, and, and the idea of interrupting, tying it back to your story and how important it is um, to interrupt and to bear witness and to do something concrete. And it may not seem like a big thing, but obviously your story from the desert, it stands out. That one act still stands out. And I know that I've been telling my folks that we really need to tap into that universalist love as idea as well. Sometimes we need to tap out of the news. We need to reconnect and ground ourselves. We need to, we need to find a ball to breathe with. We need to remember who we are and we need to have that strength and love within ourselves so that we can send that love and have that energy to, to support those who are most affected here, those who are most in da danger, those who are protesting, those who have marginalized um, identities, those whose rights are most at risk. You and I have some rights at risk at this time, um, but it is not anywhere near um, the situation that for, for some of our more marginalized communities. And then I really hope that out of all of that universalist love that there is a little bit left that we can share with our families, with you know, our neighbors, um, our children, our parents, you know, those who it is, we are needing to take really good care of ourselves right now and, and share all of that. Yeah, I'm so grateful for that, for all of the points, but certainly that last point, because I think that is at the core of the universalist message. From our conversation, I wouldn't blame folks if they came away from this thinking, I have to be brave and I have to be bold. And I hope that people will come away from this conversation thinking that. But also that universalism doesn't say you need to do any of these things in order to be good and to be loved. That's how you start, and it's non-negotiable. Right. That love belongs to you by virtue of who you are. And we're invited out of that to live more lovingly and more full-heartedly. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Sherry, I cannot thank you enough. You were the boat that swept in to my shore in New Jersey and gave me that that. Breath, air, breath of fresh air that I needed for this morning. Um, and I'm, I'm so grateful for you. And please know that, that our congregation here in Phoenix will be thinking of you in Rochester. We know that you all are heading inside now for the rest of the winter as we are just coming out. Um, we, are, we will think of you as you're continuing to work for justice for Daniel Prude and um, going through all of the amazing things that you're doing with your congregation. I carry that in my heart to our people. And with gratitude for all of you for your hospitality this morning, it has been such a joy to be with you. And I will also be carrying you in light and love. May you enjoy some cool breezes ahead. It was so good to be washed up on good luck with you. <laughs> 
Yes. Good luck is what we all need. Love you, Sherry. Thank you so much.